Hmm. All right, I'm here. Okay. Is the link on announcements? Oh shoot, it's clunk. 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 Oh shit, it's coming. Oh shit, it's coming. Something's all oh shit, it's coming. Something's all oh shit, it's coming. Something's all oh shit, it's coming. It's like we're something's all oh shit, it's coming. It's like we're something's all oh shit, it's coming. It's like we're something's all oh There you go. Yeah, the desktop audio was just repeating itself. Cool. All right. You don't hear the. Ooh, can y'all hear me? I'm gonna mute. Cool, 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 cool. Awesome, nice to meet y'all. All right. So let me get the right screen up. All right, I'll wait for like one or two more minutes to see if more folks join. Nice, nice. Glad that you can hear me, Diego. So, are y'all excited to uh, learn about how to make this website? The look? Yep, it's raw CSS and HTML. Cool, glad you're excited. Uh, Malik, is that how I pronounce your name? Nice. Okay, I think it is time to start. All right, so Hello, hope y'all are doing great today. Um, today, we will talk about getting a design from Figma all the way down to HTML and CSS code. So if y'all don't know me, I am Long Win. I am the vice president for Mobi, and I've been doing web development for like three to four years. So to kind of start things off, um, I want to explain about how to code all of this in CSS and HTML. But if we're talking about like the syntax, like, oh, selectors and tags and all that, that's kind of obvious. I really want to focus on the thought process and how it's done, basically the design patterns in HTML and CSS and start things off there. So um, to kind of explain things, I'm going to give like a conceptual overview first of like how HTML and CSS flows. 
and then uh, I'm gonna get into the live coding, right? And make this crazy website. Cool. All right, so let's see. Can y'all see my Figma? This, can y'all see the design? Uh, on my end, I can see it. So if I come over here, I'm going to, okay, cool, nice. All right, so over here, this is like, imagine if this was like a blank page, right? Basically in HTML, the most important thing to understand is that there are two things, right? You have a block and you have content, right? Two things block and content right and if you want to place this block anywhere on a web page right you have to you just have to understand how blocks just behave okay so i'm going to show that so by default every block in html works line by line right so when you add like i don't know a div a header any kind of block in html it will, con it will take up an entire line, just like this. And if you add another block, it'll be like this. And if you add another block, it'll be like this, right? But sometimes you're like, okay, sometimes I don't want it to take up the entire length of the page. So you like change the width or you change the height of a block, right? But then the problem is like, it's still line by line and you, you really want it to be like this crazy elaborate thing like this, where it's not like, you know, on its own line. It's like in its own space. So to do that, there are two more concepts you have to get, which is in HTML and CSS, any block has a, a margin and also a padding, right? So let me show what that is. So it's really important to understand the difference between margin and padding, because if you don't, you're gonna get some like weird artifacts. Some people interchangeably use padding and margin, <laughs> talking about myself like three years ago. <laughs> um, they are very different. Um, they function the same where like they, they add spacing between other elements, right? But the key difference is that margin pushes pushes things, right? They they add space outside of a block. In Figma, you can see this, right? The red outline, the the, the red text detail, uh, that is margin. But if you have content like text inside of a block, right? Um, if you don't have padding, it'll be like this. It'll be like in the corner and you're like, I don't want that. I don't want that at all. So what you gotta do is you have to add padding so you can control the content. And there are sometimes situations where, shoot, shoot. Let me get back here. There are situations where you have a box inside of a box. And sometimes you'd like it to be like a certain dimension Padding is a great way to do this, but you can even use margin sometimes. The difference is, uh, let me try to get like a normal rectangle. The difference is like, okay, if I had two rectangles, right? And I made it like this, right? If I had margin, if this had a margin, right? Over here, over here. Like imagine there's like this imaginary margin, okay? And I change the background color, it would be like, like if I change the background color to be like red and uh, I added a margin over here. Okay, let me grab the same rectangle. Like this. right? There would be like this weird space in between. Like there would be 
a space in between. But you want this to also be red. You want the spacing between this rectangle and this rectangle to, uh, like you want this rectangle to be like pushed in, but you also want this red color in because margin pushes things on the outside. Um, it kind of doesn't include the color of this inside box. So that's why knowing the distinction between um, uh, margin padding is important because it affects on how like content is displayed, right? And in some in some situations, like how it interacts with other CSS properties changes based on how you use padding and margin. So yeah, key distinction. So another thing that's important to know about HTML is that things like to go uh, from there's a certain content flow. That's what they that's what they usually call it. Like things like to go like this. They go left, they go left, and then they go down like that, like a zigzag, right? Left to right, top to bottom. That's what they call the content flow, right? Everything in HTML and CSS naturally likes to follow that flow. And you can break that flow, except, you know, and if eventually uh, it's gonna come back and bite you. So you have to really know what you're doing if you decide to like, oh, maybe I just want like something to go off the corner, right, of what it's naturally supposed to be. All right, no questions yet, cool. So another situation that's like always there in HTML and CSS is like whenever you have like sections within sections, like in this situation over here, right? This situation over here, you have section within section and you gotta sort of know how to lay that out because in HTML and CSS, literally everything you display and control is controlled by width, height, margin, padding. Those four things you control, like literally the spacing of everything. Uh, there are different tips and tricks and techniques, but that's for another day, right? So everything can be controlled with boxes and spacing, right? But to be to make sure that the content flows properly, you have to set up the boxes the right way. So in this case, you got a box over here. Like say I wanted to replicate this, right? Uh, we have three sections, one, two, three, three sections. And then in those sections, we have subsections, more boxes to add spacing around, right? And then in this last section over here, which is like probably the most complicated example, there's like content flowing on the left, down, there's just multiple directions. So I'm gonna break that part down so y'all can get a clear picture, right? So for the picture, we have one box, right? And it needs to go left and right. If y'all remember, I said, HTML likes things to be on its own line. Like blocks are naturally line by line. So it goes like this naturally. So with CSS, with CSS, um, you're able to like, even if you change the width and height, it will still be on its own line. You can change the margin to make it go left and right, but it will still be on its own line. So the only way you can do that is if you change like a fundamental property of the block in the CSS. Uh, I'll, count, I'll go over what that exactly is later, but just know that you can change it to change the way things flow. In this case, I'm using a flexible box, right? And now it flows like this, right? Where you can have blocks side by side. And then say you want two boxes stacked on top of each other. It's kind of like a shell, like things happening inside of each other with the same behavior like an onion, right? You add another block and you add another block, they stack up on top of each other naturally. And that's how you get a layout that's like this, right? And for the blocks in between, right? The text blocks, just add even more boxes. That's how that works, okay? So that's kind of like general overview of HTML and CSS. You all have any questions? Any questions? Because Honestly, when I first started, I was like, okay, this is pretty obvious. And then you get started and it's like, what are all these rules? <laughs> uh, what software for what? Like the boxes, the rectangles, all this? That, uh, it is Figma. 
it is the best design software in the world. Okay, maybe not. <laughs> There's some folks who really love Adobe XD, Envision Studio, and Sketch. Uh, how did I get started on Envision Design? Uh, oh, my bad. Figma Design. Uh, I... It's been a long time. I think I started like in 2018. <laughs> so I... I knew Photoshop before, right? And the thing about all the design software is like they're kind of inter interconnected. Learn one of them, you learn all of them. Um, for Figma, I just like started playing around with the tools and it started making sense. But one thing about Figma is like you, you, you have a tendency for like literally wanting to go wild. Like if you just look at this, there's just no organization whatsoever, but like really learning about Figma, you can place anything anywhere you want, but um, in Figma, there's a certain organization to it. And luckily, the thing about Figma is that it's a really community-oriented design tool, and it and you can like see what other people have done, and uh, you do a little bit of copy-paste here and there, and you know, you learn a couple things or two. That's how I learned Figma design, personally. Uh, which one is a good one to start with newbies? Uh, I'd say Figma because it's free. <laughs> um, I think wait, I think Envision Studio is also free, but all the other ones are actually a lot more complicated. Figma is the most friendly one because everyone uses it. And because everyone uses it, there's a lot more resources for you to learn. Um, they try to make it really friendly. Um, if you learned Figma, uh, do y'all want like some starter tips? Like, I think one thing for me is just like kind of learning how vector software works. Like, for example, I put all these rectangles everywhere, right? But like, there are certain parts to it, like, oh, this is a rectangle, but if you look at the inside the rectangle, it's like really a path, right? So like, yeah, Figma, um, it's, it's basically vector software that's super efficient for like web design, right? So like, um, there are certain parts to it, like, with all design tools, there there's some design principles in mind, right? Like for example, um, there are frames, there are rectangles, there's text, right? Uh, there's so there's like multiple principles on how they work, and when you create a thing in Figma, right? Um, I'd say playing around with this area is helpful. Um, quick things about each area. So this part is pretty playful. If you play around, you can get an understanding, but this part is where things get kind of confusing. Uh, constraints, like um, constraints are there for when you resize like a element, um, how would this interact? Like I want you to, to stay the same for both the top and bottom or top and left. Because if I remove the top constraint and I add the bottom constraint, right? Look at this, right? But look at this, All right? There you go. And then uh, another thing about Figma, it's most powerful feature. This is like the most powerful feature of Figma, components, right? But honestly, that deserves its own course, like for design systems, right? Um, I can recommend to y'all a source actually where I learned a lot about Figma, I'll post it into the chat. Hold on, let me kind of kind of get it to y'all. Cuz there like there are two tools that I did use to learn about Figma a lot. One is called Figma Ninja. The other is um, I think design code IO uh, design systems. Here, let me bring it to y'all. This is juicy resources for Figma. I love Figma Ninja. It shows you all the keyboard shortcuts and the tips and tricks. You get really good at what to do with it. Okay. Uh, yeah. Also learn a lot about a, a lot about the keyboard shortcuts. Okay. Can I paste it here? Here's a uh, Figma Ninja. Go through that and go through this, and you'll pretty much be Fig Figma God. No joke. It. I mean, there are other like other concepts, but like if you know those, like everything else is just the next step. Okay, so I think I've covered the stuff for just general HTML, but yes, you will become deity. 
Literally. <laughs> um, yeah, for Figma, where was I at again? Oh yeah, I'm, I'm gonna talk about the CSS. All right, so CSS, our friend and our enemy, right? Um, I am gonna show to y'all a website that I think, I personally think it's like the truth website. Like if you wanna know if you're doing something right or wrong, you go here. Everything I learned about web development and HTML and CSS comes from this boy, right? And I'm going to use them to show y'all what's really important about CSS because people kind of underestimate this thing. Um, if you learn how they play the game, the CSS game, okay, if I can like get the CSS reference. No, 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 no. I just want the prints. Okay, over here. Do y'all see this? Can y'all see this? Dang, they even have things <laughs> responsive at the zoom level. It's crazy. Okay, I'm just zooming in even more because I think it's just that important. So CSS, you got the syntax, which I'll kind of show y'all in the code. But the most, the three most important things, the cascade, inheritance, and specificity. I rank specificity, cascade, uh, specificity is number one, cascade is number two, and inheritance number three. Um, some things in CSS inherit, like for example, uh, the color of something can like, like if you had, let me bring up Figma again, using Figma as my whiteboard, right? So like if you had text in a box and then you had more text and you had it like, I don't know, red, then inside that box, it would also be red, right? The, the, the properties kind of inherit from each other and I'll show how that it's, it doesn't really come into play unless you're in a really certain situation because because not all things inherit in CSS but don't worry about it inheritance is kind of like out there okay so the cascade right in CSS you can like choose certain blocks or on the website and um, say you have a specific block you want to style you can have like five different ways to style it to, to style the same block and they would all style it. That's the magic of the cascade. But then the most important, like literally the problem child, <laughs> specificity. So in CSS, uh, the biggest problem with CSS is like, it's basically the largest file of global variables. It's just all these global variables just playing around with each other. Like you don't see it, but the more you do it, you're gonna like have all these global variables intermingling and just like playing around with each other. And it's like eventually gonna screw your website over many, many times. Cause you're like, where did this come from? Why is this not working this way? Why, why did that do that? Like, it doesn't make any sense. There are these, it, it becomes like, I imagine like this, like you're, you're, you're like having this tangle of wires and you just, you're just trying to untangle it. And it's just terrible. Um, specificity is like, which, styling applies to the box, right? And I'll go into more detail about specificity in just a few. First, I wanna get into the live coding, right? And we will do that with something called Glitch. Have y'all heard of Glitch? Anyone, have, anyone heard of Glitch? It's amazing. Nope, so Glitch is so say you have a web app, right? You have a node app, you have a, you have some kind of app, right? And you just want to show the world this app and you want it to be like, okay, multiple people can be on it at the same time or people can just fork it. It's like this sandbox that you can share and everyone can use, right? And I'm going to use this sandbox to like show y'all how my website works. There are a couple really interesting parts about it, right? You can even have your own terminal per project like that is not common okay so i am going to use one that i set up for y'all i think i already have it over here okay let me reset this because we're going to use the mdn in the future okay so let me share this for y'all okay you can even invite other people to edit at the same time it's collaborative 
but at the same time, you let a lot of people in, there can be a lot of chaos. All right, let me put this on the YouTube chat, which is right there. Uh, if you go there, I think what y'all are going to see, I hope I see the same thing. Hold on, let me let me get to where what y'all are gonna see, how y'all get y'all's own version of uh, what I'm doing, right? Visit the project page and you should see something like this and you wanna click on remix, remix this. Basically, remixing is a remix. You take something that already exists and you make it your own. Bam. Right? It's basically blank. So, oh shoot, I have not changed. I did, okay, hold on. I did not show y'all. It was all on Figma. Okay, my bad. Let me, let me show y'all again. My bad. Okay, so you want to check, when you go on that link, you should see something that is like... Oh, you can still only see the ASDF? Can y'all see the the glitch now? Oh, okay, cool. Nice. Okay, let me try to get back to the project page. Okay. Okay, do y'all see this page? Whenever y'all click on the link for glitch? Because I think there should be a button to remix this uh, this uh, whole project. Okay, cool. So if you remix it, it's basically taking an existing project and making it your own. There's so many things you can do with this. Like um, one thing I've done is like there's some projects that are just so cool, right? Let me see if I can find find one because I really want to give y'all this resource. Like it's amazing. Um, for example, if you're into like generative coding, is this it? This could be it. Yeah, for example, you're like, how did this person do this, right? You can just like remix it, edit the project, go into the code and like literally see what they did. And the superpower here is that you get your own terminal so you can like add like a database or like a server, like you can have a full stack app with this. So it's kind of amazing, right? For example, here you can, I have everything that I need to see this live. And if I wanna see it like literally live, I can just have a front end, like a mini browser to the right, which is so awesome, right? So much, so many things for free. Okay, so let's get back to our stuff. I have a readme that shows y'all um, just a general overview of what everything is right even some more resources uh especially this one this one's nice for anyone who wants to get into design okay so let's start at index.html okay so uh, before i get into the lab code along i will say i'm gonna do a lot of copy pasting because just because of time constraint i'm planning to like do this in 30 minutes i think i think i have, I have 30 minutes left so yeah a lot of copy pasting <laughs> I am sorry, but I think y'all are going to be able to like see my source code. Like if you just view it and like be able to copy and paste it too. But yeah, it should be good. You can show your project progress in a new window like this, right? And it's basically the state of your HTML. And the first thing I'm going to do is grab HTML5 boilerplate. Also, are y'all are y'all familiar with the term boilerplate? Because for me, I wasn't. <laughs> Let me see if I can find a good one. For example, this one over here. Let me link this to y'all so y'all have the same thing, right? Grab boilerplate, literally copy it and paste it. Bam, you have your first uh, thing, right? Even You can even add stuff into the body, which is the content of your HTML. And you can see it changed live. Another superpower of glitch. Right. Yeah, basically template code. Some people just like say, I got some boilerplate and I'm like, <laughs> Okay, so first thing I'm gonna explain to y'all what this part is. Uh, let me zoom in, it's kind of 
hard to see, right? So over here, this head part is surprisingly neglected. Like there's some metadata that's super important. For example, in this HTML over here, like the first thing, the language is set to English. And you're like, duh. I mean, we're doing an English website, so of course it's gonna be English. Let me tell you, I had an experience where I was I was developing for a um, an English, a Japanese, and a Korean website, and I had like three font families, and basically I didn't have you know the language set on some some tags. My website slowed down noticeably, and I had like an i7 or whatever on my computer. Like I had good specs, and this browser was ha having trouble keep up. So the metadata matters. That's the moral of the story, right? Make sure you set it right. For example, over here, meta char set UTF-8 means that I can type in strange characters in my body, right? Unicode. So I can type in symbols like arrows and I think it should work. Boop, 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 boop. Right? And if you check the HTML, you can see it. If you don't have this, I'm sure it won't show, but eh, it does show. So I guess some browsers, if you don't have it, it'll be like, no, you can't do it. So the other part, the title is the title of the tab, right? So I'm gonna call it we are one because the aesthetic is that we are like these rebels, these revolutionaries, and we're like web developers. The description is really important for search engine optimization. And it's like, if you go on Google and you look up anything, uh, you see this, this is the description. So yeah, I'm gonna call it the same thing for time. We are one. And then the author is the author. It's for like, again, metadata. If you're scraping, search engines love to see this information. Okay. So also in the meta part of things, there are so many things you can put here. Like for example, if you copy your link, hello? Okay, so uh, what's your question? What's your question? Mm, I guess you're still typing it. So um, I'm gonna go on for a little bit uh, for time's sake. So uh, over here, um, say you have like you want to link your website to Twitter or Facebook. Um, if you paste the link into like, I don't know, a tweet, um, it will be able to show some metadata about like your website. And I think like for Facebook, it's like open graph, right? See, even more metas. So yeah, be aware, like that meta part is pretty important. And then we're gonna get to the CSS right here. So here we have the link to the CSS and how it works is like link, we're saying we wanna use a separate CSS style and it's important to know that why that link exists because technically you can have your own CSS right here like this, right? have your own CSS here, but the only reason why we have that link is because we want, we want to keep things clean. All right. Okay. So let's get started into the CSS. And I want to kind of explain what this is all about. This is going to be like our first thought process thing. So in CSS, tip, because it's like this big mass of global variables, um, I am going to use a methodology called Bemit CSS, right? Um, the, because like, you know, it's a bunch of global variables and CSS can only do so much. There's no feature to like really organize the CSS. So like the only way we can do it is just by convention, right? Um, so what's that convention? Uh, we are using something called Bemit CSS right here. It's in the group, it's in the readme. So if y'all wanna like grab it, right in the readme, right? There's a lot more detail about it, 
but basically, uh, I am using a certain naming style, a naming convention, right? Uh, BEMIT, so the BEM part is block element modifier. So you choose a certain block, give it a name, and then you give it an element type, and then you give it some sort of modifier, right? And the idea of BEM, BEM is, uh, is really to handle that specificity problem in CSS. You give everything a specific name, and if you follow that certain pattern, you're not gonna get like all these tangly wires. It's like the CSS equivalent of keeping your wires super straight out, like cable management for um, CSS, right? And then the inverted triangle. This is the big guy for like um, controlling how specificity works, right? So the way CSS works uh, for specificity is like it starts styling based, wait, Hold on, I'm, I'm gonna get into inverted triangle later because it's easier to show y'all whenever we actually get into the code, okay? So basically over here, I want to set something up first and that's something called a normalized uh, CSS file, right? Uh, this is something that's kind of ignored. I think whenever I was a beginner, I completely dodged this, right? And it's called a normalized CSS file, right? And basically, uh, CSS by default, there's like a default CSS file on every single browser. But the problem with that is, well, it's not the same. Like something on Chrome does not style the same way something on Edge on infamously Internet Explorer. So ideally you want to make them all act the same way. You don't want to like style for a certain browser at a time. You want to make sure everything's consistent because the web is consistent everywhere. Right, so we are using normalize CSS, normalize CSS to kind of make everything the same, right? So to do that, we just go on this link. I think I also have it in the README, but I'm gonna paste it here just for y'all. And click on download, copy it, and then in a Glitch, type out the directory, followed by a slash, right? And then the name, normalize CSS. Okay, and then paste, boom, you got everything, right? So now we're gonna include it. So import and then normalize.css. And then in the index.html, make sure everything matches up, right? And you can see it here. Okay, my bad. Okay, so to open up the dev tools, make sure you have your dev tools open whenever you do this, right? I, I, I do it by keyboard shortcut on Chrome. It's different by browser, but on Chrome, it's Control Shift J. It's like, I think, uh, F, F12? Yeah, F12. You open up the development browser, and then do y'all see this little button over here? Um, this, can y'all see that? This. That is super useful. That is responsive mode, right? Uh, it makes it so you can simulate a certain screen size. And in Figma, if I bring up Figma again, you can look at the, the size of our screen just by clicking one of these. And you can see that the width is 1440 and the height is 1024. Okay, so now, now that we have that part set up, right? Sometimes you want to check if like all the CSS is actually being applied. In this case it is. You can see it over here in the sources panel. Let me make that zoomed up so y'all can see it. Sources. Right? Okay, so now let's get to the code. So typically um, CSS is, is its own thing. There's like I feel like there's always this impatience to just always get into the CSS and make stuff pretty from the get-go, but danger in that, right? Um, you haven't set up how the blocks are gonna function and basically all CSS are based off of the blocks. And if you don't have the blocks right, everything collapses. You gotta set up the foundation, right? So to do that, uh, I am going to look at I'm going to base it off of the Figma. So typically how developers and designers work together is that um, 
designers will give developers a link to the Figma where they can't really edit anything, and destroy the world, but um, they're going to be able to inspect the Figma and they're going to be able to look at certain elements and they're going to be able to see the pixel units between every element, right? And this is obviously useful because you want to like know how everything is related to each other, right? Okay, so yeah, I am going to base it off that Figma and I'm also going to send a link to this Figma so y'all have it too if y'all want to like see how something's done and how um, what we're using, right? So going back to the code. Going back to the code, right? Let's get started with the actual HTML. So if you look into Figma, ooh, let me try to get Figma like this, like on another smaller screen. I don't know if y'all can see this. Okay, that's part of the code. Ooh. I'll, we'll, we'll see if this works, <laughs> right? But if you, if you look at the Figma and see how things are divided, right? You want to work on things block by block, right? So we have three blocks, three big general blocks. And I call each of these blocks a section, but this top one is special, right? So in HTML, um, you have tags, right? Which is, you have the brackets and the slashes and the name of the element, right? And there's all sorts of elements and they're either like, a block or they're not right in this case there's a div that's a block there's a h1 tag that's a title right that's a block right and you can have more than one title and they will all stack on top of each other right like how you expect blocks to do but in this case we want only three blocks to start off of right and you want to you don't want to just call it divs because on an accessibility side of things and even on the developer side of things right you have so many divs you're gonna have like this nested tree of divs and you're gonna be like what the heck is this right you want to be able to read it so conveniently there's other tags out there like header right and section that really are exactly for this, right? You have a header and a section. Can y'all read this by the way? And also, wait, my bad. Is there any questions? Because I get kind of rambly, so um, I did go over a lot. So is there any questions, any kind of confusions, any kind of other resources that y'all are thinking about? Awesome. Thanks, Diego. All right, I guess we are good to go. All right, so let's go implement in some base, basic stuff, right? So we have a header and inside of that header, if you look into Figma, oh, do we need to learn to normalize? Uh, yes, you, my bad. That is something so great that you mentioned. Okay, so normalize um, you don't need to learn normalize because um, I wish I can bring up an user agent style sheet because basically if you look in the HTML, like you see this, this, how does this even look like this, right? Well, in every browser, there's something called an user agent style sheet. And that's basically the default styling per browser. Um, and there's like 50 billion different styles, special styles that you use. So my answer to that is like, you don't really need to learn it because you're like learning every little detail about it. Just know that you can trust normalize to make it the same, right? So you don't need to learn normalize. But another part of your question is, do we need to use it from the get go, right? Yes, because say you add normalize in the middle of a project, because normalize is kind of like intended to fix things at like a foundational level, and if you've already like made all sorts of stuff down the line, you add it, you adding it in the middle can just ruin your entire CSS like hierarchy. 
So you have to make sure you put that in at the very beginning. Very, very, very beginning. Okay. All right, so let's continue on. All right, so if you look into the Figma, hopefully y'all can sort of see it. I know it's sort of in this side. Um, let me make it bigger like this. Hopefully y'all can sort of see it still and then hide the UI. But if you can see that this header is kind of divided into blocks, I am about to do the exact same thing, but it's not gonna look like this because we haven't put into CSS yet. Let me check Mobi if there's anything people are saying. Okay, cool. All right. And then getting back into the HTML, let's replicate that one part. So we have a button, which is the title button in our Figma. So basically this thing, right? This is a button. And why did I not call it a div? Why didn't I just make a div, right? Or like a basically a general box. So a div is a general box, right? Why didn't I just choose any box? Why did I, why did I specifically choose button? Because actually um, in the relationship between HTML and CSS, certain elements have some extra meaning behind them, right? Like buttons, uh, on a screen reader, on a screen reader will read differently, but also on a functional level is it's also different, right? Um, there's a lot of pre-programmed functionality on certain HTML elements that you have to use. So, like for example, button. Let me show you. Like this. See how it's already like already predefined on what it could do. Right. Yeah, Figma is awesome. All right. And then let me see. Let me make sure that I'm styling things right. Or I'm setting up my blocks right. Okay. So yeah, we have a button. And then we have something called a nav. So basically a nav is useful because it kind of... Uh, my bad. Let me backtrack a little. So... In HTML, there's like trying to mark things up with blocks, but you have to be really careful on what you choose as your blocks because it affects your search engine optimization. It affects how screen readers are used. It can even affect your performance, right? So you have to make sure you use the right blocks. So in this case, I made sure to use a navigation block because some search engines are going to look through the navigation and kind of like use that information in its uh, scanning. And for screen readers, they know it's like, hey, this is how you navigate around the page. So using just a simple block like nav changes a lot. So in this nav, I'm gonna have a list. This is this UL is called, is an unordered list. In each UL, there will be a list item. If there's anything that's like weird or wild about HTML, always go into the MDN. Right? If you go into the Mozilla Developer Network, they explain everything in such detail. Like if you don't know why something does not work, there will be an explanation like for everything. It's so thorough, it's wonderful. Well, because I've already coded this and I don't wanna use up too much time, I'm gonna copy paste these two things, right? And you can click format to make it all pretty. Cool, so boom, this is what we have so far. Okay, so now that we have one block, the header, let's go on to the next one, this section, right? And we want to style it similarly to Figma. So in this case, in this section, we have a block and another block inside. And technically, you know, each of these text things are also a block because they're on its own line. So in this case, I'm going to make a div, which is a all purpose general block. I, I'm sorry, I think, Everything I think in HTML are blocks, right? So then I add in the elements and bam, we have the title, right? And then we're gonna move on to the next block since we already have these blocks to find out. And before I move on, any questions? Any, any questions about what I'm doing right now? Cause I'm going pretty fast. Yeah, basically, <laughs> Minecraft blocks. The whole world's blocks. All right, so let's get back to 
the next section, right? And in this next section, we're going to have a block on the left, a block on the right. And that's going to be kind of complicated. So first, we'll just focus on getting all the these blocks laid out. Read it from left to right. You have one block, which is like the, the containing block. Then you have like the inside block. And then you have the block to the side. And then you go to the top. So like you're kind of reading left to right. Like you're, you're like peeling a shell, but you're reading left to right, top to bottom, part by part, shell by shell. That makes any sense, right? So I'm going to start with the image and then I'm going to start off with these two, with this second section over here. Okay, so I'm going to go back to Figma, or I mean to uh, Glitch, and I'm going to put those in. And one thing I'm going to do that's weird is use a figure to contain an image. And the reason why I'm doing that is because images are kind of, they're, they're their own block, but sometimes you want to position them differently, right? So I use a figure as a containing block to kind of like manipulate the inside. It'd be like the equivalent of this, like let me pull up a rectangle. Okay, show the UI, be the equivalent of doing this, right? Imagine this was the image, right? What happened if I wanted it to do this, right? Position it like that. You want a containing block that lets you push things in and out. So yeah, you're just using blocks to style other blocks. Okay, so next we have, so for the image, you have to give it a source. And I think, yeah, you have to give it a source. And quick, amazing trick, if y'all know of the website Unsplash, right? Like, let me give it to y'all, Splash. If y'all need like free stock images that are actually good, use Unsplash, use it, it's your friend. But they also have an API where if you give it like a certain string, like for example, this, right, that, and you put it in the URL, you get basically what this says is give me a 1500 by 1800 picture that is cyberpunk and futuristic, boom. You get something different every time. So it gives like this impression that your static site is a lot more dynamic than what it actually is. Yep, one different every time. But I actually already have an image in store, which is this. So I will just post it here for y'all to use. And then and I also know from experience, like if you put in an image, it has its like default height and width. And if it's big, it's big. <laughs> All right, so let's get onto the next block, right? So if you look in the Figma, boop, 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 right? We have these two um, blocks on top of each other, the, the, um, the introductory text and then the uh, extra text, right? So let's put that in there. All right. So what I'm going to be using is an article in a section because technically we're introducing, actually, no, no, not an article. That's, that comes later. We need a div to make this second block, right? But then in each of these, that's an article. It, it lets you semantically or like informationally segment things and it makes things so much easier to read and search engines love it. Accessibility people love it. It's like a freebie. Just do it. Okay. So inside of this section over here, we have two blocks on top of each other. Those two things are going to be the articles. All right, before I move on, any, any questions? A 
Okay, looks like we're good so far. So uh, let's continue adding stuff. Okay, so we have two articles. And then inside of an article, inside of this article, we have a header, we have uh, a paragraph, if I can even zoom in further. So we have a header, we have a paragraph, we have another paragraph, right? So we're gonna do the exact same thing. Okay, boom. And then in the next article, we're going to have, let me see, in the Figma, we have this interesting this interesting structure, right? We have one thing, two things next to each other, like this. So this is a block. If I can do it. I don't think it's letting me. I think I'm actually moving it. Okay, so let me try this. Inspect. Okay, not working. Okay. Basically, this is a block and this is also another block. That's my point. And to make them side by side, you have to put it into another box. So basically like this. So this says one block, another block, another block, right? 11.11.2020, okay? And then the next thing we have is the actual title, which is also another block. Okay, and put this here. And then we have a paragraph that's literally the longest thing ever. And then format to make it look pretty. And then we have basically, yeah, we have the basics. This is our structure. We have all of the website. It, has, it flows properly, right? And it reads properly without a uh, any styling. So now, oh shoot, I actually have four minutes left. Should I keep on going or should I just give y'all the complete source? Y'all wanna stick, stick together? Continue on? Because technically, we always go for social coding at six. It's a real shame because I wanted to get into the CSS. Oh, you want the source? Okay. Let me give y'all the whole thing. Okay. Okay, 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 okay. Let me grab it. Where's the link? Share. Okay. And then. Okay, yeah, I've, I've posted the source here. So yeah, I'll continue to like cover this workshop. And uh, if y'all want to, I don't know, y'all can always like come back and watch it all, follow it through at some other time. But yeah, just to give y'all the whole thing, yeah, I'll continue on. Uh, are we doing social coding? Uh, I guess I'll just keep on going while things are happening. Like y'all can go ahead and head on to social coding on the Moby Discord if y'all want to, but uh, I will keep on going through with this workshop so y'all have like complete content. Okay, so let's see, where are we at? We're gonna start styling things, right? So in styles.css, let me think. Let's start with explaining the inverted triangle, right? Uh, I'm gonna go into this website and show y'all what it actually means. So if you look at this, there's like this, it's an inverted triangle. There's like a very big part and a very specific small point, right? And it kind of represents how CSS is meant to be styled, right? So in HTML, right? You have these elements, right? And in CSS, they add something called a class, right? And they also add something called an ID, right? 
And if you choose, if you add a name to the class, like hello, right? And hi, I'm just giving you all a demonstration of CSS specificity in action, right? Um, you reference the class with a dot, with, an, with a dot followed by the name of the class. And then I'm just gonna change the background to be red, okay? Right, boom, you have, we have a red background. But then say we have another, another thing called an ID, right? Uh, actually, let me do this. We want a header by itself, like without a class to be blue, right? We're gonna try to do that, okay? So we set a class. So this class right here, hello. So this is the name of the class. It follows to the CSS, hello. And then we give it like a property, which is set up like this, right? And we want the background to be red. But then we also say, yeah, this header should be blue, okay? So when we say header, we're referencing this, this header. This header should be blue. And when you say header, you say all headers should be blue, okay? So we're gonna see specificity in action. So this should be blue, this header should be blue. So yeah, it should be blue, right? But you know, I also said, gave it a class where it should be red. It's still red, what the heck, right? So C CSS classes are more specific than element names. So that's why this hello class um, takes over the, the header element class. But what happened if we get rid of it, right? Blue, bam, right? But very important distinction that I specifically, I, I, I said header. When I say just header, I mean every single header is gonna be blue, right? So if I added, if I added in, if I change this to header, which is something you shouldn't do, right? Guess what? Blue. So probably thinking like, oh my goodness, this is so much power. Like if I just type this, everything will change. Well, see, thing about CSS is that anything that's next, like it is procedural. So like the, if you try to do it again, right? Guess what? It overrides. Things can override each other. Boom. Green, right? So anything that's, if it's like the same thing, whoever wins is the next one, the last one to find. So yeah, that's green. And then um, next thing about specificity is, well, even if you have, let me see. Even if you have like things that override each other, at the very end, classes win. <laughs> and if you want to know the behind of the scenes of a specificity, there's technically a counter going on. Like every single time you use an element, it adds one. Every single time you use a class, it, add ten, it adds 10. But if you use an ID, right, an ID, which you say with a hashtag, right? And how do you specify an ID in HTML? Well, we already did it here. IDs, cool. what's up, okay? Let me see, did we, did we ever say anything here? Yep, we never set a style, so. Okay, orange, boom. IDs win above all. Even if you organize this on top, no matter what, it will be orange. And that's the danger, because if you don't follow the flow of how CSS likes, right? You're gonna have like this behavior you just don't expect. You're gonna be like trying to change it with all these styles. You're gonna change it with like 50 styles, like oh, header dot hello school to black. And it won't be able to do anything, right? So you have to be really careful with specificity 
Uh, yes, they are very specific. In fact, they're so specific that no one uses them. <laughs> no one uses them. And some people are like, but you know, this person uses them. Like they use it in this context. Why? Well, IDs are useful for two things. They're useful for links and they're useful for JavaScript when you want to specifically select something. But I will also say like, yeah, those two things. I don't actually see them a lot, but those are the two, two reasons why we um, use IDs. But yeah, those are the only two reasons why. Okay, so getting back to, shoot, I refreshed glitch. No, now it's gonna take forever to <laughs> load. So getting back to the actual CSS, right? That's why we have inverted triangle CSS. Th this is someone's solution to the problem. We have like a crap ton of like global variables and we're just trying to like make sure that we choose, we, we follow this flow. We want to choose an element first. We want to, we, then we want to choose classes, right? And we want to choose classes for anything down the line. We want to choose classes, right? Yeah, CSS so bad. <laughs> JavaScript. Actually, that, I don't know if I already mentioned this, but like specificity is so much of a problem that if you go look into React, like React styled components, and if you look into CSS modules, those are like two, like if you want to use JavaScript to help you out with um, uh, some CSS, right? Styled components is really popular if you know React. Um, the reason why is because folks just don't want to work with CSS. They hate it that much, right? Um, the problem it solves is that it keeps each style localized to each component, right? Uh, SAS, in my internship, I used SAS a lot and my, my managers hated it. <laughs> and the reason why is because you always have two groups of people. You have people who love tools. They're like, tools are the most amazing thing in the world. The more tools we have, the easier our life is. And other people are like, oh my God, you literally added another tool in our tool chain. Now we're gonna have to reset this whole entire process to fix whatever you done. And if you remove this component, well, the whole project shambles. Yeah, they did not like the CSS. They, they didn't like all the complexity it adds. It's like, you, you don't, if you know what you're doing, you don't need it, right? But I will say there's certain, there's certain parts that are really useful. Like, um, um, like there's like something called like a parent selector inside of SCSS and the variables are different. Yeah, it's huge. And you, you need the right tooling for it. But if you want to make, if you want to make anything that's tooling easier and you don't want to even think about compiler, right? I'm going to show you all something. So Webpack and um, Parcel. Parcel.js, uh, it's less, uh, less CSS. Yeah, Webpacks is awesome besides the documentation. I'm at the moment you have to write your configuration file for Webpack, you're gonna go from I love you to I hate you, like so quickly. Look at all this, it's so much like, I had to write my own for one and you're like, you try to do something and it doesn't work. You're spending five hours writing a configuration file. No kidding. It's so, it's so disgusting. But at the same time, you get so much control and that's why folks like React love that control, right? You can like set up a workflow where it sets up a web server, it compiles your SAS, it compiles your JavaScript, it lets you use all these features you'd never be able to use all at once. It takes all these images it like compiles everything, packages it up to this wonderful thing that like you can control the workflow so easily, but then you have to write the configuration for it. And the thing before um, Webpack is something called Gulp. I think gulp.js and there's like another one, but I don't remember. But the whole idea is just setting a process to like get all this BS and just like make it one thing, right? But for all these, you actually have to write something and sometimes that's just so damn intolerable, right? So that's why you can be like me, be super lazy and use something called parcel. And some folks are like, you can have no configuration. And people are like, oh my God, that's like the most crazy thing ever, right? Oh my God, no configuration, right? 
so yeah, parcels there if you want to use like all sorts, all sorts of CSS, like for example, SCSS, less, um, stylus, um, that's all there. I don't even know what stylus is. I know that for your question, Anne, um, less is an alternative to uh, SAS. And honestly, even even like uh, CSS and JS stuff, that's also like an alternative. It works so completely differently from what you usually do for CSS, right? Boop, 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 boop. Okay, so getting back to this, um, where was I at? Oh yeah, explaining Bemit. So the way Bemit works is that it sets a, it sets everything up to where specificity isn't a problem because you made this naming scheme, um, this this system, right? One one I think two benefits of inverted triangle is one you get um, you get the specificity problem solved. The second is separation of concerns. Some folks you have like the largest CSS file ever. And one design pattern I realized was that folks don't have one CSS styles at CSS. They have like multiple that kind of compound on top of each other, right? So I'm gonna do this here. So first thing you wanna do in inverted triangle is that you wanna set up any tools or settings, right? So like, this is like writing CSS, but not writing anything at all. That's their goal. You don't write any CSS at all. So yeah, that's what the settings are for and tools. Uh, tools is not really relevant here because it's more relevant in SCSS. SCSS lets you create functions in CSS. That itself is like pretty wild. Uh, if you want to know what you can do with functions in CSS, like Mixin, Mixins, you can set up a whole grid system with it. Um, I think Gutenberg SCSS. Um, yeah, like, let me see if I can find it, I think this is it. Okay, not it. I I know someone out there made like this whole library to set up all the grids or whatever, and just one mix-in. I was like, oh my goodness, it's wild. But yeah, mix-ins are also kind of problematic. Okay, so let's start off with setting up the settings, right? So basically, for me, settings are CSS variables, and I'm gonna show you all how to use those right now, actually. So first thing that I like to start off with is the typography, because arguably one CSS tri trick that like I cannot go without is that everyone likes to use the pixel unit, but the true unit I think everyone should be using is rem. Okay, so like this. And rems are basically, so one rem is equal to um, whatever the font size of your root element is. So in this case, it's HTML, right? So if I set the font size to be three, then one rem is equal to three px. And what's the power in that? In that? Well, if you have a responsive website where you literally want to change the entire spacing, rhythm, and scaling of your entire site, all you have to do is change it at one spot. That is ridiculous to me. So in this case, the default one rem is equal to 16 pixels, which is like a really nice uh, starting off point. Another thing about 16 is that it is divisible by eight. And you're like, oh my God, the math, right? Um, okay, so any it's it turns out that anything like digital, I think, like any UI loves, like loves the unit eight. Eight is like, eight is like this wonderful unit. Like everything is based off of eight, right? Um, padding, margin, spacing, width, height, everything being based off of eight. People call it the eight point grid. Like it's this magic number that just, I don't know, digital stuff loves. And not just digital stuff, but typographers too. So it's like something that really works out. Just saying, eight is a wonderful number, okay? So, so I'm gonna type this out and then explain it to y'all. Okay, so what this is over here, this is a CSS variable, right? This is really new, but everyone's able to use it now, so I can 
you need to show it because this is so useful. Like if you want to have a feature where you can set dark mode and um, light mode, this is how they do it. I think this is how even someone like Facebook does it. I remember like one really big company using just complete, like because CSS variables exist, they can have light and dark mode, All right? So yeah, big deal. Okay, so now, so what I'm gonna explain is, okay, so you specify CSS variable with two dashes like this, and then you give it a name and then bam, right? I like to use a naming convention because naming conventions are so useful in web development. Like your project can grow from nothing to like this tangle so quickly. And if you don't have a system, like you're just gonna loop like in your head, like where things are at. You wanna keep things separated and you really wanna like, if you know about separations of concerns, like you just wanna etch it in your soul. So yeah, in this case, I set the font size for a medium font size to be 1.5 rem, which is 16 times 1.5, right? That's what it means. Okay, and then this selector over here, this over here, this says select everything. So literally every single element on the web page, all of you needs to have. So the color, which is the color of the content, right? That's different from the color of the background because if you set the background color to RGBA, you have CSS has special functions. So like 500, 2.5, right? This sets everything to have like a color, right? Does it, is, is it, is it doing it? Does it like me doing that? RGBA, 255, 0.5. No, of course it doesn't work on demo. Okay, well, basically, um, this is going to set everything to have a background. What's it? Oh wait, I didn't. Imp I didn't even include it. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> okay, over here, at import. So to include the styling. Okay, where did I even include that styling? Whoops. I need to add it. I need to rename it so I can put it into CSS. So to for glitch to add it into a folder, you actually have to type it out like the folder name and the slash and then put it in there, right? And then you have to import it here. So v.css. And the reason why I include it here, because according to inverted triangle CSS, you want to set the settings first. So this is like any kind of default value color, typography, any kind of setting, you're not writing anything, anything at all. Like you don't, you're not changing anything basically, right? And then in the tools, this is relevant for SCSS. And then in generic, this is where you're like resetting certain things. You're setting, you're changing the structure of the website, but you're just like changing stuff in general. You're not making any specific decisions yet. Inverted triangle CSS is something that's my bad hard to see until you start doing it. Okay, so I give it a naming convention. This is a setting, it's typography, CSS, right? So I think this should work now. No, no, is it? Of course. Wait, let me see if it actually included it in the source. Typography. Yeah, I did. I, I, I guess it just doesn't like it. <laughs> Let me, let me try this and if it doesn't work, then we'll, we'll just have to go with it. Yeah. Okay. So in this case, when I say color, I mean the color of the content. And when we say content, like sometimes in the Mozilla developer network, oh, there's a typo. My oh, gosh. Where's the typo? Oh, background, did I spell it completely wrong? Like, oh, I said background, Jesus. <laughs> God, I've been talking too long. Thanks y'all. Okay, yeah, now it works, of course. Of course this happens. I love it during demo. Yeah, that's big L. 
Okay. Also, if you see this trick, you can see how like you know how everything's boxed together. Right? Boom, 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 boom. You got everything. Okay. All right. So let's change the color to the ver to wait, 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 wait. Did I even set that CSS variable yet? Nope, I didn't. My bad. I'm going too quickly. Okay, hold on. All right, we got to make some colors first before I use the CSS variable. Okay, so settings dot CSS slash settings slash colors. Okay, dot colors dot CSS. Oh my god, I am so curious if my DSLR camera is just gonna set off. <laughs> okay, so in the colors. Oh yeah, another thing about CSS variables, they're inherited. So like, if you choose it at the root element of the HTML, like index.html, this is the root element. Like every single block is like a child or part of this um, element. So basically, if I say, if I specify it in, in HTML, um, every single CSS variable will just proliferate throughout the entire web page. Okay, so let's set up the typography and I want this color, the color of the main text to be white. And I'm definitely referencing like the completed version because there is no way in hell I'm gonna be able to <laughs> debug things if things go wrong, okay? So here, because I set up the HTML CSS variable, the color of the main text, to use it, we have to use var, and then we use the same double dash for a CSS variable, the naming convention color, main text. I hope I got it right. Another thing about naming conventions and web, the problem of web sites in general is like, you develop your website now, and then 10, like five months in the future, you look at your CSS again. If you're not descripted, L. So everything should be white. It's not turning white. Okay, did I spell something wrong again? <laughs> Oh, I know why, because I didn't include this. So yeah, there's like always a manual step into like um, inverted triangle CSS, but the benefit outweighs just the pain of me being embarrassed on this, whatever. So bam, you can't see anything anymore. Cool, cool. That's exactly what I wanted. Okay. So now let's set up all these different colors. So this time we're gonna do the background of the page. This t this time's black. Uh, yeah. And then I'm gonna set up four more colors that I'm definitely gonna copy paste because I'm too lazy to. Bam. So cyber blue, red, white, and black. Right. So we can reuse using the just what's, what's it dry something like that. <laughs> Reuse values, okay? Okay, I've been talking for a while. Is there any questions? <laughs> Are there any questions? Okay, it looks like we are still good. Awesome, I'm surprised besides the spelling, I'm doing okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, so the next part, this is something that I got from Android is having a dimensions file uh, specifying how like the spacing right bring up Figma again right like one thing I do in Figma in my designs is use something called an eight-point grid let me try to like lay it out so y'all can see it better boop, boop, boop. is it big enough okay cool uh, this is good enough right So if you look at my Figma, right, all like there's this question, like how should things be spaced? And again, magic number is eight. Everything I do is based off of eight, right? See 64, this is supposed to be 64. Imagine it, if it's 64. Um, this is also based off of an eight base number, multiple, whatever. Eight, eight. Sometimes it's like different by one or two. Figma's like that. But yeah, it's always based off of an eight. Okay, so getting back to it. 
I am going to specify that same spacing. And I'm even going to include styles that we haven't even seen in the future, right? Like we haven't seen now. So uh, it's just for convenience. So yeah, settings. And in Android, it's like something like dimensions. Like that, right? And I am just going to include this here because it is so, so convenient, right? And I use this, this naming convention for like extra, extra small, extra small, small, medium, right? Notice how it's just like all the spacing. The benefit is that it's granular. Like I can, it's like, I know exactly what kind of spacing it is besides one rem, right? It's either one rem or that's just really, really small. And it also makes aligning things really easy for this layout. Okay, so again, we have to include it. Don't forget it like I always do. All right, so settings.dimensions.css. That's gonna do absolutely nothing. So yeah, um, now that we have the dimensions, now it's the time to start styling out um, any gen generic or normal things. So if I can remember, my bad. Uh, Elements. Let me explain elements over here. So in HTML, we have um, body, my bad. So we have like, each of these are elements, right? They're just, they're just things on their own, right? If I made a div, div is an element, right? This is an element, this is an element. All these general things are elements. They're just default things, no styling. Um, no specialization, not even a web component, right? So yeah, so that's where those would go. So in this case, it can even be something abstract. I think in this case, I used the entire page as an element. Why didn't I just say like, okay, this body, okay, why didn't I say a paragraph as an element, right? Man, I'm just playing with semantics here. I wanna make it confusing for y'all. There's an HTML element and then there's an abstract element, right? Uh, it's just in the name of uh, inverted triangle CSS. They use element for anything that's kind of like super general, like a page, a whole section of a blog, right? Like just whole huge, huge things. So in this case, I am going to use a page. So this time I'm going to import it before I even say anything. Okay. Okay, elements, CSS, not elements, uh, page, CSS. Okay, and then inside the elements, we're gonna style things about the page in general. So usually this means something about the body, right? That's the entire page. In this case, we want the background color. Sometimes being more specific helps. Background is a very powerful CSS element. If you look into HTML, like if you look in the Mozilla Developer Network for background, Like just looking at it, it is so extensive. Let's see, no, that's not right. Oh, wow, it is not wanting to look that up. See, like these are all the things you can control with background and some crazy effects, you have to know some of them. Like for example, background clip is one really good one, right? So yeah, just saying, background is powerful. But this time I wanna be really specific. So I think color um, cyber black, I hope that's right. Yeah, there you go, right? I think there's one thing I did not include for the typography, hold on. Okay, cool, I got it. All right, so I want the entire website to be black, so I already modified that in the element, the page element. Okay, and let me think, the next step is we're gonna actually get more specific into what we're gonna do with the page. So in this case, I'm gonna start styling out the header. And this is gonna be our introduction to Flexbox. 
So here, I want the header, which is like a whole element, right? To be a flexbox. And what flexbox does is that by default, it just collapses things together. Flexbox makes a box flexible. You can get, a, you can basically the parent container is specified as a flexible box, but every child element becomes different. Like they can line up next to each other. They can line up in a column. They can grow, they can shrink. They can wrap around. Um, you can control how much they grow, how much they shrink, um, how they're positioned, right? You can, you change basically the entire behavior of how things are spaced just by using Flexbox and it's super convenient. In this case, I'm gonna use flex flow, which is a way for me to say, I want you to flow in a row and I don't want you to wrap. I don't want you to like, if it's too big, I don't want you to just loop on over, right? And it should look the same. Okay, so next thing we need to do is I wanna include in the font family, right? And typically I do that inside of a generic. So sometimes you have like, uh, so if you look over here, generic, any reset or normalization goes here, right? So basically normalizing does so much uh, normalization, but sometimes you wanna make default styling your way and ba make, basically choosing your own defaults, right? So that's where you add a generic. So in this case, I call it generic reset to con just contain all the resets available, right? Okay. And in this case, I just want to include the font family, which is, it's on Google fonts, actually Goldman. I really like it. It's Sci so scientific, so sci-fi. They said it was also for like thriller movies and stuff. I can see it. Okay, I haven't, I don't think I actually set the font family yet. Okay, so other things that we would like to reset. Okay, so there's this boilerplate that everyone loves and it's this. I see it everywhere. Which is this font. Right. Um, basically what this says is, okay, set the font size and then choose a font from here. And basically they're choosing the best font for that operating system, each and every single one of them, because they're believing like the default one is just terrible. So yeah, they're choosing the most default one. In this case, I add Goldman on top so I can make everything the same font. Boom. Okay. All right, cool. And then there's some other boilerplate that we have to add. So for example, there's like font weight, which changes how bold the font is, font style, which changes if it's an italic or not, and then text rendering. So this changes how like, like if you look, if you zoom in very close to the text, right, you're gonna change some settings on how it's rendered to make sure it's more readable. And then this one is specific to Chrome, but if you have an anti-alias, the edges are smoother, so it's nicer to read. And text transform, you can change the case of a character all in the CSS. There you go, right? And one thing I don't like about the normalized button is how there's like a curve Oh dang, I can't even zoom in. But yeah, there's a curve there, right? And also, um, there's an outline, but you can't see it. So in that button, I'm gonna remove the border radius and set the border to zero. Okay, and then for the paragraphs, I just don't want it to have I don't want it to be uppercase. So I remove that, right? Boom, it's like this now. Okay, and then now for every single heading, four, five, six, I wanna change the line height to 1.2. So basically line height is just the spacing between the text, 
So I make it a little bit more readable that way. Okay, so next up, let me see. If you go down in the inverted, the inverted triangle CSS, um, whatever. By the way, um, I actually don't really develop my CSS like this. Sometimes you add as you go, right? The benefit of inverted triangle CSS is that everything is kind of segmented off. So if you make a change down the line or up above, it doesn't really like, the, the behavior is very predictable and things change when you want it. And that itself is glorious in CSS. Like you don't want the situation where you can't change anything at all. Okay, so now, let me think. Next up is any kind of objects, like a layout, a container, a drawer. A lot of patterns in even React, they like to call things containers, their layouts, frameworks, uh, what else? There's always like a name for one of those. But yeah, they, they, they have a name and um, that's where these go, right? But basically I don't really have any shared styles across multiple pages, so I'm not really gonna use this section. I'm gonna focus more on like specific things like a header, a footer, an avatar, right? Specific things. Because if you look into Figma, have I been covering? Okay, yeah, if you look into Figma, we are just choosing specific things. We're not making like this general wide scale web page. Okay, so in the components, right? I'm just going to add what I've already completed here, just so y'all have like a, y'all can see ahead what's gonna happen, right? We're gonna do one for buttons, all the buttons, basically one, which is this, this button over here. We're doing one for navigation, which is this top section. We're going to do one for the hero section, and that's just a naming convention for this uh, top portion over here. Basically your attention getter. And then, um, let me do this. We're gonna have one for the information, which is this whole section. And then the about section, which is this, some introductory text. And then we're gonna have one for the blog, which is, you know, this, this section over here. Okay. All right. So let's keep on going. So I'll start off with the button and specifically this blue button over here, the, this thing. Boop, if you can see it. Okay. And what I'm going to do is I am not here. Okay. Let me get back to where I was. I'm going to make this look like the Figma. So to do that, I have to make my CSS file. So import CSS components dot buttons dot CSS. Cool. Just like that. Okay. And I am going to use classes. One thing about Bemit and inverted triangle CSS is that what you're going to find out pretty much for everyone is that everyone, they tend to not use element selectors. They use only classes. And the reason why classes are like the same everywhere. There's only one rule of classes. Whoever is the last one wins, right? So it's predictable. You don't have to kind of guess like, oh, is this an element? Is this a class? No, they're all class names. Everything is styled with a class name. Unless you're like at the top level of the triangle, right? So I am going to make a class name called button title. So how inverted triangle CSS works is uh, Bemit specific specifically is. So you want to give it give the name of the actual containing element, whatever you want to call it. So not here, but button, and then you want to give it like something a little bit more spe specific about it. So in this case, it's a title, right? So we have button title. And then if you look here, it matches up, right? And then you can say background's red. Boom, it's red. So we want to make sure we use CSS variables. So color 
fiber blue. So if you look here, you can see it. Okay. And then we're going to add a padding because we want to add spacing. Actually, we don't even want to add spacing, but we want to control the spacing between the app solution and the uh, button. So in this case, we're going to do this. So this is a very small padding, right? And if you look at this, sometimes when you have enough space, right, it's just going to pad the way you want it to be. And to get this highlight, by the way, you want to choose this. This will highlight the elements. Okay, if I can get it to like 100%. Boop. Reset. Okay, maybe it doesn't want to reset. Okay, it's whatever. Okay, so now I want to change the font size inside of the box. So and then, so this says, make the text inside of this button uh, uppercase and also change the size of it. Now, when I say margin is zero, I'm saying this button shouldn't add any spacing around it. And I will explain to y'all what margin left auto does in a few, because this is how you play with spacing in flex boxes. Margins are different in flex boxes. Okay, okay, this part, I'm just not gonna mention that part right now. <laughs> See, notice how it pushed all the way to the right because margin left auto basically means, okay, you're gonna like, you have like an undefined margin, so just take all of it. <laughs> so in this case, I said every, everything is zero except toward, except the left. The left can take everything. If I said the left is zero, it would have been like that. So yeah, that's why I have it like that. Cool. But I'd like for it to not do that, right? Um, and to not do that, sometimes you have to use um, a helper div. I like to call them helper divs to help you place your elements properly. So in this case, I'm going to add a div and I'm gonna call it Container, right? Okay, and then format it to make it look pretty. And now we have this outer div where the behavior of margin left auto doesn't really affect it. But we're gonna keep the margin left auto because we still want that behavior. We still want it to, if you see like partially have this undefined space towards the left. Okay, and um, let's see. Hold on, there's some comments on Discord. I completely missed them. Hold on, let me, let me see. Whoa, that was like an hour, that was like an hour ago, time flied. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, thank you so much, y'all. It's so nice to hear. I'm glad I was explaining things good because like, I don't know, a lot of things on, I don't know, a lot of people like to explain things literally. So I don't know, maybe this talk aloud is helping people. And my camera turned off, I knew it. Okay, Uh, yeah, so I guess y'all won't be able to see me, but I'm just gonna keep on coding. <laughs> okay. So yeah, if I'm just talking along right now, it's like way past time for uh, uh, what you call it for an actual workshop. Like this is like super long at this point. Um, but uh, I'm just assuming like just folks are just gonna watch later. So um, if y'all have any questions, just let me know on the Discord. Uh, just some other time, right? 
Or if y'all y'all are still here, just let me know. <laughs> I'm just assuming folks have already left. I'm just I'm, and I'm just like recording this walk this code along. Okay, so where was I? Okay, I was focused on like getting this button to look right. Okay, so the next step is to get this the navigation to look right as well. Like there's bullet points, what the heck is that? And it's not even spaced properly. So uh, yeah, let's fix that. So now I'm gonna add a new component. So I was just focusing on a button. So I kept, I separated my concerns and like focused only on a button here. And I do that because again, CSS is like a big global variable, it's just mess. And you just wanna separate things predictably. So what you have to do is you have to like make sure you create all these extra sections or else you're just going to go crazy. So in this case, I'm going to add a component for navigation where we, we're going to focus per particularly on just navigation. Okay. So here. All right. So let me see. I give it a lot of names. Okay. So hold on. Let me try to see how to explain this. Okay, first we're gonna start off with the list. Okay, so um, for the list over here, right? This is an unordered list again, right? Unordered list is just a list of bullet points. Okay, and a nav is another block. It just tells us this is a navigation for any kind of accessibility uh, screen readers or a search engine optimization, right? So we want to specifically style the list. So we're going to add a class to it and we're going to call it navigation list. And again, I gave it the name of uh, the general block, which is navigation and what it exactly is, which is the list. And this is, by the way, this is not exactly BEM. This is, this is actually like my modified version of it just to fit with how I use it. Cause the thing about naming conventions is that no one follows them. Like you can tell like 50 people, Hey, you need to do it like this way. You're not going to be able to tell 50 people to do that. Like I remember telling my bosses that once and they're like, hm, very funny. All right, let's keep on going. <laughs> so like, yeah. Well, I mean, they didn't literally say that, but they were, they were like, mm, not going to work out how you, you think it's going to be. Okay. So, Let's get back to getting the navigation right. So we have a navigation list and I'm also gonna make it a flex box. And the reason why is because, you know, I can choose to make each of these child elements. I'm gonna do some advanced wizardry right now. <laughs> All right, so I can do this. Okay, to be, um, this and I think they would just be side to side yeah you can do it like that but because you do it like that you lose on the ability to control the spacing between the only way you can control the spacing is with margin and padding but when you have a collection of items it's just way more useful to do it display flex it's just like one line in general and you can like change so many things like I'm gonna I'm gonna work with some wizardry here hold on Okay, so right now, if you click on this button over here and you you see the width of this, this is like only a certain size, the magic only happens when it's like, let me set it like, this is 80 viewport widths. This is 80% of the screen. So boom, 80% of the screen, as you can see, it's a very long screen. And one thing you can do with flex, centering things is like no biggie justify content. So like basically saying align this to the center and boom. You know how hard it is to do it like not that? <laughs> to not do that. That is, it is so annoying. Look at this, you can do this, space around. When this first came out, it was magic to people. It was like wizardry, right? And it still is, everyone loves Flexbox. We just love to use it. So yeah, display flex is the way to go. Okay, and I always like to say flex flow just to be explicit. 
because if you leave things up to question, people are going to be assuming they're like, okay, so is, does it wrap? Does it not wrap? Like you don't know for sure. So you want to be explicit because in the future, you're going to love, you're, you're going to love yourself for doing that. Right. And I set the padding to be zero because there is default styling and I want to get rid of you. That's it. Okay. So now here is a CSS misconception. I wish I could like highlight certain parts of a, of a video like literally underline it and say, this is super, 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 like extra, 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 extra important. A lot of CSS tutorials just do this. And people kind of like miss the meaning of that, right? Like when you say navigation list, right? This is saying in this block, every single list that inside of this block will be styled the same way. And I'm just going to show y'all what that looks like. Okay. Okay. So there shouldn't be a list style, but I'm just going to do this for example. Right. So each of the list items are red, but if you go into like, if you add another unordered list inside of a list item, and then you choose to like call it, yo, what's up, right? Shoot, 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 shoot. Check it out. This is awesome. Even this is styled. What's going on? Even this is styled, right? You're like, mm, maybe that's what I want. Good. That's what you want. But like in the future, in the future, um, in the future, when you're like having this unexpected thing just flow down the line, like like you're, you're basically allowing styling to leak do what you intended it to style, right? You didn't mean for this to like have a red background, but does it hurt right now? Not really, but in the future, um, you're gonna have a bunch of styles interweave with each other and you're not gonna know why. Cause sometimes in CSS, actually big time in CSS, just having a style changes, like can cancel out other styles, right? Like for example, in a flex box, um, like if you, let's see, in a flex box, uh, in a list item, like you can have a flex basis, uh, three, four rem, right? Let me see if this works. See, like you can change, so basically flex basis is equal to width, but it's not width, right? It only works inside of a flex box and you're like inside of a flex box. The problem is if you have like width, Width overrides the flex basis. It cancels it out. So if you have width, it cancels out. Yeah, I just said that. <laughs> but basically what I'm saying is that some styles are dependent on another style just being there. And if you do this like carelessly, you're going to have like all this unexpected behavior because of some other style that happened to inherit down the line or some style that you accidentally apply. So in general, I, it's so funny how everyone is like doing it in this way, but it's so dangerous, like architecturally, like when you do CSS, you want, you only want to change what you want to change. You don't want to like accidentally do this thing. Cause say down the line, you're like, okay, uh, you know, it looks good right now, but you want to add something in the future, but you had this one general thing leak everywhere and it happened. The reason, only reason why your style works is because of this specific listing. But you don't want, like, for example, you don't want this f this flex basis. You don't want an extra width, right? And you try to get rid of it, and then everything that depended on this style breaks. So yeah, like it, it causes like this whole dependency loop problem. So basically, moral of the story in CSS, you want to be really specific about what you choose, right? You only want to style only a certain part. So how do you do that? There's actually more than, you know, the space. There's this, oh my goodness. There's this, this is a direct descendant. This is a adjacent sibling. This is a, um, I don't even know the name of it. I only know the functionality, <laughs> but yeah, there's a lot you can do. Like 
if I say this, this it says only the direct descendant or only like like if you had a box, right? Let me do this in Figma so I can like show because it like you know it's so hard to explain. Okay, so if you had a box, let me see if it it's visible in OBS. But if you had like a box, right? And then you had, let me, let me change the opacity. So it's even easier to see. So here, so if you had a box and then you had another box, right? Inside that box. Okay, back to the explanation. Where was, what was I getting at? Basically, when I said this is red, right? Only the first thing inside will be red. This will still be gray, 100%. So let me, let me explain that more clearly, right? So this is a child, this is a child of this rectangle. And inside of this rectangle is another rectangle. And they're all ch a child of this big rectangle over here. The biggest difference is that like the styling is only applied to this rectangle, not this one, because this is a direct child. This is just directly under this rectangle and this is not. So yeah, there's that part. So what I expect to see is that last list item that we added, not going to be red. Oh, come on. I knew you would do that. <laughs> I am so not surprised. Uh, every single time I do a demo. Okay, let me see what's up. Oh, it's because this is a list item itself. So this list item background is red. If I change it like this, I bet it will work. See? Let me let me let me make that example more clear because I think I kind of confused y'all there. So basically, this is a list item, and we said that a okay, a list item should be red, right? Well, that list was also in that list item, so if I set it to red, then it's red. <laughs> um, let me try to think of a good example. So... Actually, yeah, yeah, this is it, right? It didn't select this list item over here. But um, if I did not include that, then it is red. There you go, right? Because it, it, it literally travels down the, 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 the children. It's not good, right? That's why you want this, so you can be specific. I wanna go over the, I don't, I don't think I'll go over this this time, but I'll definitely have this, I'll, I'll have an example for this, right? Okay, so back to the styling, okay. Uh, I am going to set the width to a variable that I calculated, right? This is, this is a variable I calculated. It aligns exactly, my bad. It, exa it, it aligns exactly to, um, to the elements width of each other. Like they're, they're all related. So this width is the same. Like this, this width is the same, this width is the same, this spacing is the same, right? Like everything is based off each other, right? And that's good because uh, I think in graphics design, right? Um, you can have all this chaos that, that, might, that might be something you want, but when things are related, uh, a good thing to know is that it's a subconscious relationship. Like when things are subconsciously related and the same, there's some, this is a, it's a certain order and unity, right? It's just aesthetically pleasing. Cause if everything was random and I don't think anything is like completely random, like there's always some sort of pattern and some sort of like similar relationship, um, it's more aesthetically pleasing, right? It, it doesn't feel rickety. It doesn't feel shaken in its design. It feels more consistent. So yeah, always try to be consistent. <laughs> Follow a pattern. Okay, boom, right? Now it's all even in spacing. Okay. And 
I know this part won't make sense right now, but y'all will be able to get it later. Hold on. That part's just for the future. Right now, basically what I just added, right? I wanted to make the widths the same. So basically, um, notice how this over here lines up with this paragraph. So let me let me zoom in. So show how UI. This over here lines up with this paragraph. This paragraph lines up here. See, imagine if there was an invisible line. And uh, I'm getting kind of into design world or graphics design world. But basically, um, having these two things lined up together invisibly, it's that's like an invisible rhythm to follow, right? It aligns things invisibly, keeps things consistent for the same aesthetic reason I said before. So yeah, that's why I set the width to be exactly that. And that's not good for, uh, you know, responsive design, but we aren't going to cover that today. Ooh, two hour mark. Cool. All right, let's keep on going. <laughs> For real? <laughs> I'm like, who's still here? <laughs> this is like way longer than I thought, but I'm, I'm kind of glad that y'all are still here. The boom, yes, for sure. Who's still here? I don't know, but we'll, I don't know, we'll see. <laughs> I'm just going to keep on going. I think we're like 40, 50% there, right? I mean, this, this whole thing took me like three hours to make, I think. And I kind of, I think I might've overestimated how long it would take here, but it's so useful to just to learn how to make in an entirety. So yeah, let's keep, let's just keep on going. Okay, next part, next part. I think I handled the navigation. Did I, I already explained this part, why the spacing is this way, right? And the spacing towards the left, I did not do something. Yes, I did not do something. Okay, let's, let's, we're not done with the navigation yet. So I, so we need the spacing in between, right? Over here. And this is where, again, Flexbox is useful. So I'm going to get over to here, right? I should drink some water. <laughs> I've been talking for so long. Okay. All right. So, uh, okay. So we want to style the entire navigation, right? Not just one part. So I am going to make this a class. And why did I make it that class? Why didn't I just use nav? Because we, as it turns out, one of the best designs websites out there, Stripe, like if you want to look at a de facto standard for a web, a website's design, like literally every web designer is like, oh my God, Stripe. I, I remember when Stripe redesigned their website earlier this year and every web designer on Twitter was just like losing their shit. They're like, oh my God, Stripe redesigned their website. We're like, the world's just blowing up, right? Basically, they're the de facto standard and I found out they have no, multiple navs. So yeah, um, yeah, you want to make sure you choose one. And again, being specific is a good thing because you don't want those memory, those styles to leak. It's, I hate using like memory leak as a metaphor because I really hate low end stuff, but at the same time, it's like perfectly suitable here. It's like a memory leak. You want to be specific for that reason, unless you like a memory leak, like you want it to happen. Sometimes you want memory leak to happen. You know, you can be like super creative, like, oh, I just want things to just blow up. I feel that. I feel that. <laughs> That's, that's super artistic. I love it. I want to see stuff like that. Okay. Okay. So I believe I called it navigation main, right? And basically in navigation main, what I'm going to do. Oh my God. So Jock, you're still here. Ah, oh, that's so awesome. I'm so happy. Yeah. 
Okay, so uh, navigation main. Oh my god, I'm like jumping in thoughts. Okay, let me go back to the Figma so it's easier to show. So notice how everything's like space in this fluid way, right? So uh, let me let me look at this. Let me reference again. Oh yeah, so like again the even the even units. Okay, so basically, if I can zoom in even closer. Notice how there's like a specific margin over here, like a certain width, a, mar a certain margin, my bad. A certain amount that it's pushing. And it lines up with this to that, right? I mean, not exactly, but the, the idea is that things are aligning. So let's get back. So now I'm just gonna add a margin. And here's specialty. In CSS, you have functions, right? I think y'all saw already saw some of them. This time, calc, calc is actually really useful. Um, it's math, right? It lets you change things. It lets, you, it lets you make things based off of another thing. In this case, a variable, which is very, very useful. So in this case, I'm saying I want you to be based off of column with one and column width one, by the way, is the width of this picture, which aligns with this button. But everything is connected. It's like this crazy, I don't know, it's a grid, it's grid systems in practice, right? Everything's connected. It's this mystical thing, all right? Two times bar. Okay, so uh, two times bar spacing mediums. So. The spacing mediums, what is that? Basically, the spacing mediums, oh my goodness. Okay, if I can show y'all somewhere. It's the it's the margining. It is the margin it, it's wait, hold on. I know I know what it I know what it is. It's this over here. You see that? Over here? 48 pixels? Yeah, that's what that is. Basically adding all those things together instead of like doing it yourself. The reason why I do that. Why did I do that? Why didn't I just like calculate it beforehand? Because if you have to calculate it beforehand, right? And you wanted to say, change the spacing of the entire website, then you can't. <laughs> but you leave it towards calculations, you can, right? So that's why that's useful, right? Always make things that flexible, right? Don't, I mean, in general with code, you just don't want to hard code things. But like in this case, that's just a great example of that. So, it pushes it to the towards the left. Now we basically have the top part of our navigation. It is so wonderful. I think the only thing that I did not do is just set the right font size. I'm not exactly sure. I have to reference my completed code for that. But yeah, in general, uh... oh wait, we didn't add the spacing. We didn't add the spacing for this. See, this spacing over here, this buddy. And I'm gonna use a trick for that. So I like to use, technically this should go into objects, but I'm too lazy to make it. So so col column width three, what is that, right? I'm just reminding because this was my own system and y'all didn't make the system. So I have, so everyone's on the same page, right? It's the width of this image, which is aligning with this button. <laughs> oh shoot. Okay, so I decided to make this container, right? And remember this, uh, where was it? Where are you? It's in the button. Remember this margin left auto buddy right here, right? Remember, remember that guy, okay? So button title containers right here. It's a wrap around the button, right? And what I expect it to do, okay? Cause this is kind of like random. Like I said, boxes let you, you do everything, like position anything. Um, I also want to just say like, they can be used like a utility too, like to help space something, right? So in this case, I want it to be where I want this box, right? That aligns with the picture on the, on the right, but I also want this like leftover spacing towards the left. Okay. So to do that, I set up this container 
to be a flexible box. And because it's a flexible box, it changes the behavior of margin, right? And because it changes the behavior of margin, when I set margin left to be auto and the margin right to be zero, okay? So again, I'm just gonna show this box, right? It should align if I did it right. Hold on. It should align right, okay? Oh, it did not. Okay, I missed something. <laughs> what did I miss? Let me see. Right your left auto. Okay. Did I do this right? Did I make sure the display is right? Oh yeah, yeah, that's why. Display is blocked. So basically, this is one of those CSS like, uh, it doesn't work unless you have it rule. <laughs> like it, like for example, to make this part work, like where it automatically like calculates the right amount of margin to push everything towards the right to make sure that the right margin is zero, it need this button has to be considered a block element. And I think what it was before, it was an inline block element. Like you have to be really specific with CSS because if you're not specific, it'll be like, well, I'm not gonna let you do that. <laughs> but basically, moral of the story, we got this line. We got this whole, we got this, uh, this top part. Yay, that took like an hour, cool. But the best part about CSS is that once you set up the system, it kind of like continually builds up. You build up a good system once and you just live with it forever. It's so nice. Okay, so getting back to this, let's work on the hero section. So I'm going to make CSS slash components hero CSS, right? And to remind y'all in the inverted triangle CSS layout, it's right here, hero, okay? And what I'm gonna do with the hero is I'm going to give it, I'm gonna give it class names because again, everyone loves being specific because if you're not specific, you're gonna get like all these unintentional styles. Okay, so in this case, we're gonna call you section hero. Okay, and we're gonna get back to the b -b -b components. Hero. I wonder who, how many are left? Ding, y'all five are dedicated. I am amazed. Okay, I'm gonna set the background. I'm gonna go to the assets and y'all should be able to, if y'all remixed this, this, um, y'all should be able to get the background. Okay, so you copy the image link right here and then you go to HTML and then you're going to go into, where are we again? I'm lost, my bad. It is in the hero. So you gotta say, you gotta give it a URL. That's the URL, put it in quotes because it has to be. And then you give it a background. Boom, you can see it. It's that yellow thing right there. Cool. Okay, background, size, cover. This is really important, right? Um, basically, pictures can be all sorts of sizes, right? Um, they can be tall, they can be short. But, som but sometimes you want that picture to like com contain the entire, like to expand the entire uh, block, right? So if you say background size cover, it will, it will expand the picture to contain the entire block. And it will also, um, zoom in right and it won't stretch it it will just zoom in exactly the way you want it to be sometimes but most of the times and then i'm gonna set for rem so basically this is a naming convention for adding padding this says put four rems or four times 16 pixels on the top and bottom of uh the block and then towards the left and right don't add anything and what i expect to see is spacing on the top and bottom, right? Boom. And by the way, notice how this background covers the top and bottom, right? 
Imagine if I didn't have mar padding. Imagine if I had margin. Oh my god, you have like, you have the spacing, but look at the picture. That picture ain't contain like it's not containing, like it's not expanding past like the actual width. So I guess a good way to explain it is padding includes uh, the space, like that. There you go. And then we want to add our aesthetic top and bottom. So this says, I want a weight, a line weight of one pixel. I want it to be solid, not dashed or any weird styling. And I want it to be the color cyber, cyber white, which is what we defined in this here, right? Okay, and then I'm gonna do the same thing for the bottom. Okay. And then now, okay, we're gonna focus. So notice how this title is not that big yet. We're gonna make it big, all right? Title. Okay, this is CSS that I already know. But I'm gonna show y'all where this goes, okay? So basically, I want all of these, header these headers to be big right but sometimes you can do it like this you can be like let me give y'all like two ways to do it right um zero idle okay and this extra dash is called a modifier in bemet right block element modifier modifier is just a little a change in state in this case, it's my kind of convention. So for me, I just make it even more specific. <laughs> so uh, back in Hero, right? I say every single heading inside of that div over here. So for this, and then this heading over here, uh, you, I wanted it to be, boop, 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 boop. Okay, I, I wanna make the font size huge nine rems oh my goodness right but it's so aesthetic i love it i love big type anyways <laughs> and i and here's the thing another graphics design tip um the bigger the font size the smaller the line height can be okay it's it's allowed and sometimes it looks more aesthetic that way right it's actually a common uh, design trick so then I don't want it to have any margins because actually by default, a header has margins. See, margin, margin, header, header ones have margins. So we're gonna remove that and we're going to make, we're gonna set every single position inside of each one to be relative. What does that mean? Well, I'll show y'all how position relative works in a few, but I also wanna explain like what position relative is in general, right? Position relative makes every single, uh, my bad, in this case, every single header relative, but position relative makes a position something, uh, let me just do it. <laughs> it. It's easier, it's easier shown. Okay. Okay, bam, no more margin, right? But, right? I'm going to do some wild CSS right here, right? And I'm going to explain it to y'all what this does, okay? So position relative lets you move what... So right now, naturally in the flow, it is positioned like this. But what been if I wanted it to be offset, you know, just a little bit some way, right? Then you use position relative to kind of break it out of where it would usually be. So in this case... Here's what I'm saying. In the container hero title, right? I want the headings and for that heading, right? This is kind of like a special modifier to the selection. Um, it's called like a pseudo class, right? Um, I'm saying that for the heading, right? That if it is the second child, move it to the right 40, I mean, move it to the left 42. You're like, it says right. 
Well, think about think of it pushing it towards the right, not like moving it towards the right, but pushing it towards the right. Um, so again, so this is that div, right? And it selects this header, and then okay, and then inside of this hero. So instead of this for for that header, right? Comparing it to all to, to comparing it to its sibling siblings, right? If it's the second one, then shift it to the left 42. But this by if you do it like this way, it saves you some time to not like um it saves you time to not write a new class, a new style every single time. It keeps things consistent. Like you always know this is gonna be like the second child, this is gonna be the third child, right? So what I'm, I'm expecting is an offset. Boom. You're like, I can't see anything. That's right. We want it to be only on one line, but it, but the text is wrapping. I don't want that, right? So to do that, special property, white space, no wrap, basically, for the behavior of adding white space characters, right? You're saying don't even add line breaks, right? Don't don't make it wrap. Okay, so boom, it's done, right? That heading part's done. Okay, so now we're going to go to the next part, which is arguably the hardest part. Okay, thanks, y'all. Y'all are so awesome. The five who is still watching. Unbelievable. Okay. So, okay. The next section, I call it the information section. So over here, this, this section over here, I'm going to call it section information. All right. So then I'm going to make a new thing. So I'm going to call it component CSS dot component slash components dot uh, information dot CSS. Okay. And in information, I'm going to do the same thing because I want these two sections to be this picture and all this content to be side by side, right? So to do that, display flex and then flex flow. So I'm saying this should be in a flow, this should be a row and it should not wrap. Let's go on. Oh, wait, did I, did I, did I spell it right? Section information, section information. Did I add it to the styles components? CSS. Uh, that's weird. Hold on. Let me, let me, let, it's time to debug, right? Let's, let's see what's up. Okay. And it looks like the styling did not apply. If I look at the developer settings, like if you look closely, it's still a block, right? This section should be display flex, but it, it's still a block. So it means, it means that I can get like it to be the original size. It means that the styling did not apply, right? So like this, I don't think this got import imported. So let's see if the naming's right. CSS information. Maybe it's been like so long. Okay. I wonder what's up. Section. I promise I'll be able to find you. Sometimes like I just copy paste to see if like I actually spelled it right. We'll see, we'll see. Oh.
Hmm. Hold on, let me look at the sources. See if I actually even like imported it. Oh. Nothing's here. Yeah, nothing's here. Components information dot uh oh might be like some server bug let's see there you go bam yeah i think it was just a server bug okay so uh or maybe i just named something wrong and a copy paste actually fixed it you know sometimes it works okay so over here you see like it's like right next to each other so the content is flowing the way we want it to flow, which is great. So um, let's get back to actually styling it. So one thing that I want to do is add, make this whole image thing actually a column. That's the one thing I didn't actually do in the design. So imagine if this continued, right? That's, we're just gonna add some extra space. So for that, I'm gonna give that extra space information aside. Okay, so the reason why I'm doing that is because I know what's up, what's gonna happen. Okay, so um, I think over here, right? So over here, this is just a figure, but I want it to contain mul maybe multiple figures, maybe like so literally an ad because I'm evil. <laughs> But more like this is like cyberpunk world and of course there would be an ad over there, right? So Yeah, there we're let, let, let me let me make it make more sense right here, right two figures So they can lay, stay lay on top of each other because if we didn't have this div, right? If we didn't have that Right I am expecting those images to be right next to each other Yep and they break the layout so bad that it does that. <laughs> so yeah, you got to have a block to let things flow down the line. Like for quick review, right? So like blocks like to stack on top of each other, they like to take the entire width. The reason why it like, so this, this div over here lets the figures stack on top of each other. And this, this stack of things on top of each other is allowed to be right next to this text because it's inside of a section that happens to be a flex box, which says everything's gonna be in a row, right? So that's why things are right next to each other. Okay, so shin sides, right? And then if you go back to the information sides part, And you look at the figures, there's that. I'm gonna need a review. Okay, so for every, for, so I wanted to add like the lines. So I'm gonna do that right now. And I'm just gonna copy paste it. I've been typing everything too much. <laughs> like, like that. And then notice how this is taking up way too much space, right? I mean, the line is pretty cool, but it's taking way up to way too much space. So remember, we had a CSS variable for a standard width. Oh shoot, I think. Yeah, we, we had a CSS variable for a standard width. And you're like, this that didn't work. What happened? Well, width does not, it's not inherited, right? I mean, it sort of is, but it isn't, right? Look at this. So the information asides, the width is right, but the figures, yeah, they inherited the width, right? But the images, no. And I, that's probably because like, there's a lot of things that could be going on. Like, it's not just one thing. There's like literally a list, like it's almost like a checkbox. Like if you have this and that and this and that, this will happen. If you have this and this and this and this, this will happen. If you don't have that, that will happen. Like it's super conditional. That's why it's so annoying. But if you like don't know the conditions, Mozilla Developer Network. Every time, I promise, they tell you all of the conditions on why something does work or doesn't work, right? 
Sometimes you have to search things a certain way, but this has everything, literally. Okay, so uh, so to fix that, we're going to say here, right? You're saying, so here in information asides, I'm saying, I don't want you to have any margins. I don't want any spacing for you. I don't want you to have any spacing, right? And I also don't want you I don't want anything inside of this column of content to have any spacing. And it does, right? Look at this. You see the image and you look at the figure. The figure has margins. The orange is the margins, right? So you do margin inherit, which says take the margin from the parent, right? So this figure's parent is information asides. And remember, I'm choosing direct descendants. That's very important, direct descendants. I'm not saying if there's a figure inside of a figure, that third figure is not going to be selected because we don't want the, the leaking. So I say, even though the width did inherit, I'm going to explicitly say it here because, you know, sometimes, honestly, there's a good chance this doesn't actually work and I don't actually know what I'm doing, but it gives me a lot of comfort and that's why it's there. Is it a good thing to have? Maybe, but it kind of gives you a reassurance that you know, it's kind of like commenting, like, you know what's going on. And here, I give the calc, I'm doing this calculation for the height of a figure. And uh, this happens to be the height of a whole portrait, right? It's like 16, uh, no, not, not even 16. It's a little bit more than that. But um, yeah, it's based off of that. Okay. And I want every picture to have a white border at the bottom. Okay. You can see it. White border, white border. Okay, maybe not because the figures are now on top of each other. The images are, are laying on top of each other, but the figures aren't. The figures are being friendly, not the images. And you're like, okay, get the images under control. Okay, I will. <laughs> okay. Okay, I'm, gonna, I'm also gonna explain that. And I'm going to explain this. Actually, I'm not going to explain this just yet. I'm going to say width, inherit, height, inherit, right? So everything's inherited. Watch, magic, boom. We're all friends now. Isn't that nice? Okay. So basically, this is saying um, inherit this width, this width inherits that width, this height inherits this height, this height maybe inherited that height. <laughs> There are some rules for inheritance. This says in that column, right? If you remember, this is the column, right? In that column, I am going so long, like maybe three hours. Going so. Uh, it's good. I love going over time. Actually, that was a terrible thing, but still, it's kind of fun. All right, so uh, let's see. Where was I again? I can't remember. I lost my track. <laughs> I've been coding, like, honestly, if you coding a website goes this well the first time around, I think I'm gonna like, I don't know, maybe you're my god. Like, I just wanna, I, I'm just gonna start believing you like this mythological hero. Okay, well, okay, back to explaining. Okay, so the, that one column, inside that column there's a figure. So that's like all those pictures, if I can find that. So there are all these pictures. And then inside of that, well, they're, they're not the actual pictures. Inside of these picture containers, that's the figure, right? There's a there's the actual picture, right? And sometimes the picture can be like way too big and like maybe way too wide. So you say object fit cover, um, it is the equivalent of background size cover, but for like an actual block. Background size is just like for a background of a block but object fit cover is for like an actual element. This is a really useful CSS that's really hidden. Barely changed anything, but it didn't stretch the image at all. Because actually, by the way, if 
you did have that, right? And you set the height to be like 50 VH, which is 50% of the height of the screen. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. All right, notice how it's stretching it. Like, nasty. Ew. Disgusting. You're stretching it. But if you have object fit cover for an image, look, it zoomed in. That is so nice. So yeah. All right, so here, okay, we, we, we got the styling for the image. And now there's one thing I wanna do with this image and it's a cool thing. It's that unsplash trick I was talking to y'all about. So if you use, it's been a while since I talked about that trick, <laughs> but basically unsplash has a source where you can just grab a random image anytime. So I'm gonna do that. So instead of like having the source be like specific, you can say, give me something random. And you can use this for so many things. Like it's not just like unsplash, but you can use it for like placeholders, um, getting specific pictures from a server, right? But without like actually making those pictures. So yeah, you get like something random each time. It's pretty cool, right? So Let's get to the next step, all right? The next step is to style each of these sections, which I call, I make it more specific, right? Um, so each article, I think, right? Inside of each article, I actually call it another section because it makes sense, more sense that way. An about section and a a uh, blog section, okay? And that's where I'm gonna add the last two CSS elements. Dot blog CSS, boop, and then CSS of components dot about CSS. Okay. How many of y'all still here? Oh my God, five. Y'all are so amazing. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna keep on going. This is like the last two, like the last two. It's so awesome. We're almost there. We're in the home stretch. We're gonna make it. We're gonna be alive. This is the worst battle ever, but we're still okay. <laughs> All right, so let's style this blog, right? Let's add in the borders. So the pretty stuff, Boop. okay. Bam, and it looks so close. Like you look at the Figma, we're getting there, right? And it actually, in it, in its own way, it's pretty aesthetic because um, getting on a design tangent, but like just because things are just left the way they are naturally, um, you know, there's no styling to it. That is an artistic decision. Okay, all right, and it is so bothersome that this is literally on the edge, but that's yet another design choice. Like if, you, if you're thinking about web design, right? Like some people are like, you need to do this and you need to do that. If you don't do that, you're a bad web designer, right? You're, you're destroying UX, but you know, you know, sometimes it's not all about UX. Okay. Folks are like, it has to be all about UX, but sometimes it's so much about the art behind it, right? Like, if this is at the edge, you're just like making a statement against all the other people who likes to have spacing. You're like, I'm against the world order. I'm special, man. I don't know. You're, you're, you are trying to say something and that itself kind of gives some respect, you know, making an artistic decision. Ooh, reconnecting. What is going on? Oh, okay. Okay. So. I am adding padding in general. So every single one of the padding will have a, I think it's gonna be, let me show you all in the Figma. It is going to be about 32 pixels, which is like two rems, right? Actually, you can even check medium, small. Oh, that's three rems, three rems. Yeah, that's three rems. Okay, I was wrong. Oh, 
Wait, why? What is this? This ain't right. This ain't. This this is not right. That's a blog, right? Well, I think that's the leftover artifact. But yeah, it's just this. We have added. Uh, that's three rams, so that should be like forty-eight. So if you look at this, fifty is close to forty-eight. Fifty is close to forty-eight. So this is fifty. 50 pixels apart, not here, but here, this is 50 pixel apart, and this is 48. So both of these are 48. It is close enough. Okay. Something. I think this developer thing is f freaking out. And once you reset it, 1440. Oh my God, I've destroyed the matrix. I've destroyed a matrix. Oh my goodness. What have I done? What have I done? <laughs> oh my god. I didn't even know this could happen. Yeah. I, I think I actually made it bug, bug out. Hold on. Here, 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 here. Let's, let's, let's. Re oh my god. Okay, maybe I really did destroy the matrix. <laughs> I'm not sure what's going on, actually. This is a new one for me. Let me see. I think I might have missed something in like a, a reset. No, no, that's not it. Okay, well, we're gonna stick with this for now. <laughs> And hopefully we'll we'll figure out why that was the way it was. That actually never happened to me while I was actually developing this website on its own. Okay, so let's let's figure out how to get this to work over here. So in the about section, shoot, I put this in the blog. Okay, blog about. I am setting the display to flex, and the reason why the flex flow no, no wrap is because we want this to be side by side, right? This, and this, and this, and this is side by side, and that should work. Boom, right? And I want the the padding for. Uh, this to be small this should be like 32 pixels and i want the left one to be particularly longer so medium right also i'm just going to give like a ver css variable problem if you don't have the dash or you say it wrong it's just going to keep let you do it but it's not going to, it's just not going to apply it, right? And that can be an invisible mug sometimes. But yeah, you get it like that, boom, you're good. Now, more CSS magic. This says, okay, and in, in my about section, and select all things directly un inside me. Literally, like select all things directly inside me. It'd be the equivalent pulling up Figma just for a visual example, right? Like if you had this, oh my gosh. If you had this, 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 and this, it would select all the red ones, right? And there are all these different elements, but no matter what, that star says select all of them. And I hope I recorded that. Did I record that? Yeah. Okay, select all of them. And then the margin for you will be zero. Basically, okay, in the about section, some of them are gonna have like some default margining. You don't want that. <laughs> but you do want to have it have space in between. Small, x small. Shoot, I was already typing that out. And then you want to 
So flex basis is like width, but it, but because it's the flex basis, it lets you um, it lets you have additional functionality with other flex op flexible objects, right? Like there, for example, there's something called flex grow and flex shrink, and basically. Um, that lets you control how things are stretching and growing, and it works with flex basis. So it's important to make that distinction because basically it's like width, but it's not equal to width, right? <laughs> As you can see, I actually set the width here. So everything's gonna be the same width, right? And another thing we're gonna do is yeah, that's enough, that's enough of that part. The only reason why this is going so well is because I am referencing something I've already completed and sort of explaining it as I write it. This never goes this well for like actual real world web development. Okay, so let me slow down and explain this part. So margin zero, this had the default margining and we got rid of it. And we said everything needs to be the same width. So everything is the same width. And we we're saying, everything um i'm saying for okay all of them it's gonna have the same margin to the left did i even spell that right see if you don't spell things right for css variables it's not gonna like you right so everything's gonna have the same width but for that specific header the header two right it's gonna have a longer uh, margin so if you look in the figma right this has a margin of 48. This has a margin of 24. So yeah, so this has a longer margin than this. Okay. All right, next step. I want the width of this one to be a little bit shorter. And I want the font size to be bigger. And then I want the weight to be of an ordinary size. Okay. Ooh. I think I just said it. Yeah, I just normalized the weight, the size of it. That's right. Cool. And then in these about sections paragraphs, which are these two things, boop, boop, right? I want font size to be 0 0.875 rems, which should be like 12, 12, I'm saying 12, I'm saying 12, 12, 14, close, dang it, 14 pixels. Okay, that is all for this section, right? And if this works, okay, I gotta figure out what, what happened to you. I think I might know what it is, hold on. I want to fix it. That is so annoying. It is so, so, so annoying. Okay, 14, 1024. I think what's causing the issue is just like an overflow. I feel like I also did not include something super important. Hold on. <laughs> this rendering is so weird. Okay, I am going to try to just refresh both glitch. I wonder why, like, whenever I reset <laughs> the, um, oh, whoa. Uh, 
I guess we'll we'll see as it comes together. But even the body is not at that length. Something is allowing it to display. Oh, 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 oh. I missed an element somewhere. I know it. I knew it. I missed an element. <laughs> okay. So I thought I have included it. Sometimes you shouldn't assume things, right? And you should also can like purely just copy code and just expect it to work. So basically in the hero section, right? Go here. This is overflowing. Like the content is much bigger than the container. But we said white space, no wrap. Cause if we didn't have that, everything would be sweet and fine, right? But we said, no, break the rules. Don't do that, right? So everything did break the rules, right? Except, you know, when it overflows, we never said how it should overflow. And that is actually a common problem in CSS, which is overflow. And it is super complicated. Like if it has, like I told you, it's like literally a checkbox. Like if it's visible, if it's one of them is like hidden, then the other is that. If one of them is this, then the other is that, right? Basically, one thing you can know for sure is that if you set both to hidden, it will be hidden. Boom, problem solved, problem solved. There you go. Overflow of hidden helps you make some interesting masking effects. So yeah, you might want to play with that. Cool. Back to the blog. God, that was bothering me so much. Yeah, back to the blog. So I made sure everything was consistent in the blog, right? Yeah, everything's still streaming. Cool. I was concerned like something stopped working and I'm like talking in, into blank space. Okay, so um, now that we've gotten this part, I think we're on like the home stretch. So this last part, um, the blog. Notice how this is actually a, a block. So over here, this is one block and this is a block stacked up on top of another block. But we need it to be side by side because in the Figma, we said, I want it to be side by side. And I want it to have these dimensions, right? 16 pixels, that's one rem, right? And five pixels up and bottom, so that's like a fourth of a rem, right? So yeah, we want those dimensions. And we also want this to be of a certain font size. And Figma tells us what that font size is. If you like click on the text in particular, it tells you right here, the size is like 96 pixels. That's like, I don't even know how many rims. I think that's like, I'm giving it a guess. Uh, I don't know. I don't want to do math. So let's get back to it, right? So the margin top will be zero. Why do we do that? So this should be the blog title here and in the Figma right it's only 16 above so we need to fix that but I don't think I even like said what the title was see here Did I do it right? Blog. Did I put it in the right spot? Oh no, I did not put it in the right spot. This is in the about section. Gosh, doing it for this long is getting to me. Can do this. All right. Here, bam, it's gone. All right, so next step. Now we wanna make that blog title like big. And then you, if it's bold, don't. And then make sure that it is the line, the line height between each of them is the same. So each, each letter, right? That's just typographic being specific. 
But then again, I did say like you can because it's so big, you can even like reduce the the line height. I think I did like zero point eight seven five before, and it would be like fine. All right, it's barely noticeable of a difference, but yeah, that's there. So now we're gonna style that block with the news and the date, right? I call it the blog metadata because it kind of is. This is the topic, news, and then the, the date. So we want it to be side by side. So yeah, display flex, flex flow, row, no wrap. And honestly, by default, a flex box is a row. It's the, the direction is a row, but um, I don't know about the wrapping part. I think it by default wraps. Right, so uh, nothing happens because we did not give it, give the this class. So blog metadata. Again, you're like you're not being consistent with your naming convention, and I'm like, of course not, because no one follows it. <laughs> like if you try to, it's gonna be so frustrating. Like imagine like you have like 50 designers or 50 web developers on one website, and like one person didn't follow it, and like you caused this whole catastrophe because you didn't follow a rule. It's annoying. Just make sure it works and it stays consistent. <laughs> okay, so I want to make sure that the font size is a little bit bigger because uh, in Figma it's a little bit bigger. Again, I really like to use RAM calculations because it makes things so like you can see the the difference in, in the differences in scale so easily, right? And this is 18 pixels, which happens to be 1.125 of 16. So yeah, I did the calculations beforehand. So this would go a bit quicker. Okay, so the margin bottom is gonna be like two rems. See, if you can see, oh, 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 there is a very special situation going on. Okay, we have an example of margin collapsing, for real. Did it actually do that? No, we don't. Okay, good. Because uh, that's actually a common problem. Sometimes this over here, right? This thing has a margin bottom and this thing has a margin top. And you think that if both of them share the same margin, they're pushing against the same thing, right? You think like, oh, maybe they just add it together. No, they don't. Um, what happens is that the larger margin wins. Okay, so blog metadata div. So now I'm saying, okay, both of these are divs, right? These are both 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 of these are blocks, right? And I am saying I'm, I want to select both of you, and I want to make your font size one m. And I will explain to y'all what one m is all about. It's similar to one rem. Okay, so. This is just playing with um, the the math. Oh wow! Yeah. So I'll explain to you what this is all about in a bit. Okay. So I am selecting both of the 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 news and the date, and I am setting their individual font sizes to be one M, and one M is going to be the font size of the current element. So if I said this is 3px, 1m is 3 pixels here, right? But if I had a child, right, div, div, right, 1m is equal to 3px, but 1rem is equal to 16px. So it's like a localized rem. Okay, and then we have a div and this padding. Okay, this is the convention for saying on the top and bottom, I want to take this spacing variable. So if you go into these the dimensions, xx like small is one rem, and one rem is 16 pixels, right? And in the blog, I said divided by two, which is eight pixels, right? And then I want the left and right to be. Uh, just one RAM, which is 16 pixels. 
So yeah, it's pretty close to these dimensions. Pretty, pretty close. Right? And you can even see it. And then now we're gonna make it look pretty. Data topic. So here's what happens when you don't use pseudo elements. You have to make one for all of them. Data, so background metadata, date. Give it, you have one for each, right? We're about to be like literally done. Yay, finally. God, this took like three hours. Good, or is it three hours? I started at five, so it took, yeah, it literally took three hours. Oh my God. Maybe I did, did not take three hours when I did this. Maybe I did like 12 hours and I didn't even know it. <laughs> is that healthy? healthy? I don't think so. Okay, so basically, um, the background color of the topic is going to be white, just like the Figma. But the color of the text is black. And for the date, just add a border. Okay, 1px solid uh, var color cyber white. And that's it. We're done. <laughs> That, that took forever, unbelievable, but we actually got there. So yeah, we it is amazing. We've truly taken over the world, combined ourselves into this consciousness, whatever crazy stuff I'm talking about here. Oh, I didn't I didn't even add the thing yet. Yeah, I'm like, I'm, we're done. Okay. Oh shoot, I accidentally typed that. Okay. So we're going to call it BG metadata topic BG metadata date. All right. Hmm. Looks like I did not style that right. Oh, I did not spell it right. Come on, loading. I, it still does not like that. What did I do wrong? BG metadata date. BG metadata date 1px solid. Okay, border. Shoot. Literally, the last element is getting me. Beautiful. Did I actually add another dash? Okay, cool. And, uh,. Class is equal to, it's right in front of my face. Unbelievable. There you go. We're done. Yeah, done. <laughs> and that is it. That is literally going from code, I mean from design to code, everything. And now the next steps would be making it responsive. So like literally doing this, like at each break point, but that's kind of like an experience you gotta have for another day. There's like a whole, there's a whole nother bag of worms for that. But in this case, we got it, right? It is done, it is there. And it even works in this case, right? With pictures changing each time. Now I want to show the power of CSS variables, right? Or like just in general. Okay, let me see if I can find a... Page typography. Okay, here. What happened if I said font size is three rounds, three, 32 pixels, double the original amount. Look at this, watch. Everything scaled. Look at that. That is crazy. Like if you're doing responsive web design, you can like if you have a 4K screen, it's so easy. You just like multiply it by two, and everything scales, right? We didn't have to go through each little thing and fix it. Everything kind of scaled up on its own. So yeah. What happened if you wanted to make it smaller? Can you even say that? Again, everything scales. It is the most glorious thing ever. So it helps a lot with like some parts of web, like 
some parts of uh, responsive web design. I know that some creatively developed sites, they actually like have a like a font size that's really like based on the viewport, right? So like maybe 2% of it. And you can get some really interesting effects like this, right? Like you can make it bigger and smaller, but like grow in a different way. Like some, some, some developers have weird tricks like that. Um, and also demonstrating what happens if you use CSS variables. Let's just make this light themed. Black, right? Cyber white. This is not right, <laughs> but you're going to do it anyways. Boom. Boom. Right? Look at that. The only reason why this doesn't work is because this is supposed to be, <laughs> this, the background is black. But yeah, we basically turn it to white light theme, right? Easy. And if we wanted to change a color, just like, cause why not? Um, cyber white, we can just change it to like red, orange. I wonder if this is a color. Okay, no, it's not. See, changed all the colors, red. Changed the, okay. Okay, and then changed the text background. I mean the, the color of the text, the red. Now it's like super, super cyberpunky. And then the blue to white, right? Look at how you can easily theme stuff. The vibe completely changes and it's that easy. Okay, so yeah, enough of the, <laughs> enough of the showing off. We are done. Boom, okay. So other things I wanna add is if you want to find out more things, just check out the README. And if you have any questions for me and other web design stuff or web development stuff, talk to me on Discord. I am here and available. All right. And that should be all. I am so thankful for y'all. Whoever has stayed with me for like three hours. I think they're like, it's, it's telling me there's five people watching, but it's amazing. Um, thank y'all so much. And if you decide to watch this later, thank y'all for staying with me for three hours. It's been awesome.